Programs in science, technology, and society are emerging across the country and internationally as a response to new challenges to understand rapid changes in society due to technological advances and scientific innovations. So we're studying a very unique team here at UT Austin and at MD Anderson. They are developing a new tool for treating prostate cancer and they are working together uh, in ways that they've never worked together before. So we feel that if we can better understand how the scientists are communicating with each other, then we can better solve the problems at hand. Because it's very clear to everyone that you, it's not only necessary to have the science, but it's also necessary to understand how the science is impacting society and how society and cultural values and belief systems impact the ways that we're doing science. Traditionally, science stood on two pillars. Uh, one pillar was observation, and the second pillar on which science is based is theory. You make hypotheses as to way as to how events physical events happen and the interchange between theory and observation is the foundation of science well now something new has been added to the scene what is new is the computer and computation some people regard it as a third pillar of science and engineering it means that by using models mathematical models of events you can make predictions about the future. Today, computers are much more than just a number crunching machine. They are a communication device. They are a good uh, platform for doing the modeling and simulation and the prototyping uh, and the testing. So you start to think of all the uses that computers can have, and clearly the medical sciences need them. In many ways, we're bringing engineering and science to medicine. Medicine traditionally was a diagnostic field where based on experience, decisions were made about treatment of diseases. Now we're actually quantifying the behavior of physical systems. Medicine by itself is not going to succeed in automating and making treatment as effective as it can be. Computer science by itself can't do anything. Engineering by itself can't do anything. But the three things together provide a real foundation who are doing great things, and we, we should all recognize that. The project we're working on is built around a model of heat, temperature, bioheat transfer. This is one area where we have extraordinarily good predictive methods. Uh, we learned about two years ago through experiments with mice, working with our colleagues at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, we could predict the evolution of temperature in cancerous tissue with amazing accuracy. So our project is one of a growing number of projects across the world in which modeling and simulation methods are used to make predictions about functioning of biological systems and even the human body. Living systems are the most complex that exist and uh, when we're doing a surgical procedure on a living system to be able to uh, collect meaningful data about how that system is responding to the surgery and to make changes during the actual surgical process based on an intelligent understanding of what we can change to better achieve the surgical outcome is an extremely powerful tool. The common you know, way to diagnose the problem is by using something called imaging. And today, imaging has progressed such that you can do three-dimensional imaging of not only what you see on the outside, like in photographs, but also through the body. The ability to actually create images that are temperature sensitive has really evolved probably over the last 10 years. 
and uh, the techniques uh, kind of vary in, in the approaches and have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but probably the, the biggest limitations have been the spatial resolution, the temper resolution, and the temperature sensitivity. So what we've really spent our time for the last you know, seven or eight years is looking at how can we how can we modify the way the MR scanner operates so that we get faster images that are higher spatial resolution with better temperature sensitivity. So basically the reason why MR is considered to be important for this sort of therapy is that the prostatic anatomy, the anatomy of the prostate, is demonstrated much more clearly on MRI than any, of, any other imaging modality. Uh, what you're looking at here is some T2 weighted images which basically show the structures of the prostate very well as well as the surrounding critical structures uh, such as the rectum. Um, and this coupled with uh, new techniques like dynamic contrast enhanced imaging and spectroscopy allow us to localize the disease uh, much better than in times past. And when you couple this with the temperature imaging, we're able to plan, treat, and guide the therapy as well as validate our response to the therapy before the patient ever leaves the table. And that's basically the purpose of doing the entire procedure on the MR scanner. Treatment planning for any type of cancer treatment is always very important. Um, what this new element, uh, the fast computation that uh, UT Austin offers, uh, brings to the table is the ability to check the treatment as check the treatment against the original plan as it's happening in real time. That you know that's the goal of what we're doing with the imaging is we need to speed it up so that we can get the data into the the computational model fast enough to get get an inverse model or an inverse solution back that can affect the ongoing treatment. That, that takes maybe, you know, 10 or 12 minutes. What is new is the model. You will find groups across the country using imaging to say, oh, there's a, there's a cancer, it's growing at a certain rate, and we can look at it, we can see it. But how fast it will grow and how it will uh, react to various therapies is not known, other than purely empirical. So we're trying to develop models to really trace and simulate quantitatively how these events happen in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a living species. Modeling has, has essentially two parts to it. One is what you're trying to do is within the computer, you're trying to capture the phenomena you want to study. So the example was cancer treatment planning. You have to come up with a realistic, you know, uh, duplication of the scenario which is in the physical world in a virtual world on your computer. So modeling consists of coming up with the right geometry, the right set of equations perhaps, the right set of variables that will have to be captured. Um, so this is like setting up the, uh, what we can sometimes often call a quantitative description of the phenomena that you want to study. Our example of cyber infrastructure is we take a unique world-class facility at MD Anderson, which is 150, 160 miles away, operated by top people. We take their data that they generate with actual physical experiments using MRI and MRTI devices. We send that over a high bandwidth network. We capture that signal in our visualization laboratory. We generate a three-dimensional image of the prostate or of the brain, whatever the uh, subject of the operation is to be. And then we have a computer model that models what's going on. The model captures the temperature that's being uh, uh, generated. It's, it's evolving due to an energy source. The energy source is the laser. The laser is inserting energy, and the energy is being converted into heat. The proteins in the cell um, do not function at all temperatures, and at a certain temperature, then the uh, proteins will not be able to function and then the cell will die. So the goal is to kill 
those cancer cells as many as possible and at the same time not to kill the uh, normal cells. And we're doing that inside the MR magnet and monitoring the therapy in real time so that we can predict the outcome. And the link with UT is actually to take that data that's coming off the scanner, these, these temperature images, and feed them into a computational algorithm that simulates uh, the temperature distribution and predicts the outcome. And then use that to modulate the therapy in real time so that we can affect the best outcome we possibly can, the most conformal treatment possible. There are some very interesting aspects of this process because it is in a surgical environment as opposed to what most engineers work on for heat transfer. For instance, uh, the t tumor and the s surrounding prostate tissue are alive th and therefore they have blood flowing through the, the tumor and the prostate. The blood is a different temperature than the uh, tissue is while it's being uh, uh, radiated with a laser and therefore that changes the whole heat transfer process makes it much more complicated uh, to understand it makes it more complex to develop a computer model for it and it's much more of a challenging problem uh, we also uh, change the heat transfer in the process by introducing gold nanoparticles. Using the nanotechnology, what we are considering is that you can see that this nano shell is only like say uh, 50 to 100 nanometers in diameter. Now, if you inject those nano shells into the tumor, that will greatly enhance the thermal effect. Basically, you can treat larger areas. So that's the whole, uh, whole point to bring in the nanotechnology. So of course there are challenges. You know, it's where to put it and how much to put it, and then what you, under what what the percentage. And also the nice thing about this nano shell, they can tune for different kind of laser wavelengths. So all those things can be optimized using computation. That's our expertise goes into, and then to uh, collaborating with them to to design very effective. As you can see from the very nature, it needs not only computer scientists and engineers, medical doctors, uh, and physicists because they can look at how treatment will propagate through various media, also people who can acquire the imaging. Uh, so it's an interdisciplinary team of people. Scientists from different fields trying to look at the same problem from different points of view. One thing we see all the time is the necessity to translate constantly from one field to the other, from biology to mathematics, from mathematics to computer science, from computer science to physics, to, to all these different uh, disciplines that are involved. So that's one of the interesting things to observe, how, the sci how each scientist has to translate constantly what his work is. And so in that process, a new understanding of the body is constructed collectively. How do you do interdisciplinary research? It takes a willingness of the participants to collaborate and to educate their comrades to really have an effective uh, program in interdisciplinary research. It's always difficult to speak to people who, for, with, with whom you have little common background. What you have to do is you have to look them in the eye you have to see whether or not they're understanding what you say. And if you, they understand what you're saying, then you know you've done it right. If you haven't, then you have to ask questions and uh, keep on going from there. Without having people with such positive attitudes toward the sister institutions and toward people who are different than them but can help them solve problems, it would be impossible to make this kind of a project work. But uh, uh, the collaboration turns out to be the essential strength of what makes our project so good. Everybody in the team knows something about the whole, uh, all, the, uh, all the parts, and is working more details on some parts. And I believe that today, in the computational science, in this interdisciplinary problem, the teamwork 
is essential. Teamwork in, in, in a way that everybody knows something about the whole thing, understand each other, but is concentrating on the one part. Because these problems are so large that nobody could concentrate in a very detail in all the parts, and therefore the teamwork is necessary. And I believe this is becoming a dominating um, pattern and a dominating mode of operation for most of the challenging industries and research centers worldwide. So it's, it's becoming more and more common at this university and other places that you see many people coming from different you know, areas with different degrees, different specialties, working on the same project. What we have done to date is to develop one of the most sophisticated computer simulation systems in the world for bioheat transfer. It is an extraordinarily complex and uh, sophisticated computational system. Well, first of all, we all come up with a very uh, robust, efficient, and a reliable uh, software infrastructure and integrated with uh, uh, the uh, MRI technology, the cutting edge, which can provide um, the reliable treatment and the control and monitoring for prostate cancer. You're creating a platform technology that could be used in you know any any looking at heat shock protein expression in any tissue tumor uh, system, as long as we know what those those input characteristics of the heat shock protein are for the normal tissue and and the disease tissue. We have been doing a lot of the initial work in cell cultures and in small animal models. We're progressing to a larger animal model, which is a big step forward. And once we have uh, experience and success with a large animal model, then the next step forward is to a human trial. Uh, in order to get to that point, we're talking about many years yet of research to occur. And it's a never-ending process. And as you learn more and more, you go deeper into the subject. You realize that uh, there's never an end to um, the questions that are, arise during uh, a research uh, project. And as you know, that cancer is the number two killers in the nation. So, and uh, we need to do something about it as scientists. And, uh, and uh, I think that's uh, part of the obligations they have to.